All right. Well, hello, everyone. Hey, Amy, uh, we are at 9.02, and I know there's going to be many, 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 many questions for Alice. So how are we doing? Um, you know. Oh, people are still coming in. Who's squeaking? Somebody's squeaking. I know who it is. I, I know who the person is. <laughs> It's, it's okay. the penny whistle person. It's the penny whistler. <laughs> Does it have a new name? <laughs> the penny whistler? Penny whistler? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's called the nose glute now. Okay. <laughs> nose flute? No, nose flute was something else. <laughs> um, Ocarina? <laughs> Macarena? No, ocarina. You didn't play one of those either. No. no. Oh no, yeah. Those no, are all like ocarinas. precursor to being able to play the recorder. No. <laughs> when I was a kid. You had to do all that kind of I used of to like to first. play piano and pretend that I actually knew by just following if the notes were going up and down. Just play it really loud at my grandmother's house. Much to the chagrin of everybody upstairs. All right. All right. Are we ready? I are you ready? Is Alice you ready? Know, I'm ready. Alice looks ready. ready. I, I'm about as ready as I'm gonna be. Okay. <laughs> I'll let him in. I'll admit. Okay. <laughs> Count us in, Amy. Okay. All right. There's that there's that graphic for you, Alice. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it's the end of the week. Now, where you been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday, so come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We got a presenter that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday, we're on the loose. We'll be the train, you be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. Wonderful song. Great. Thank you, Amy. Amy, I'm turning over. Uh oh, I got a, I had a beach ball on my cursor. Doesn't that mean that something's wrong with your laptop? I have no idea, but I'm frightened. No, it's gone now. Okay, All right, great. I'm turning over the, um, you can let people in as we have our few last people come in. Welcome to Feedback Friday. This is Kathy Hot Tori from Botanical Colors. And today, oh my goodness, we have the best person joining us from um, the UK, from England. So uh, I'll tell you about that in just a second. But Feedback Friday is our show where we talk with artists, writers, historians, activists, uh, people who like walk around looking for pigments on the ground, um, just about anybody who's interested in what we're interested, which is the natural world and color. Uh, joining me today is Amy Dufo, Director of Communications based in Cape Cod. I'm in Seattle, and we're really pleased that you are with us today to welcome uh, Alice Fox. Before I start talking about how amazing Alice is, I just wanna make um, a few announcements. Uh, I'm gonna be doing a, a Q&A uh, Wednesday, September 21st, is that correct, 21st? Uh, 9 a.m. Pacific, there's an RSVP under uh, workshops on our website, botanicalcolors.com. And uh, I'm just going to be talking about the dyes, how kind of their, what's interesting to the, about them to me, how to use them, um, and just kind of go through them. It's a one hour, mostly um, just kind of a review and then a Q&A for people who worked with them and had any questions about them. Um, we have a workshop with um, vegetable printing with John Marshall, our good friend in Mendocino. And I believe uh, that class starts on October 4th. So um, if you're interested, you should sign up because he does need to send you his amazing 
full of treasures and things you've never seen before materials kit along with um, the class information. Um, I'm also doing a, an in real life workshop at the ba uh, Bainbridge Artist Resource Network on Bainbridge Island on November 5th. And we're going to be um, dyeing and stitching a table runner and napkins for holiday. So if you're interested in how to do a um, naturally dyed turkey kind of motif, I'm just kidding. Um, join us, it's gonna be fun. I've got vintage linens and all sorts of interesting um, fabric scraps as well as we'll be able to do our own dyeing um, as well. So it'll be really fun. And last thing is that we're starting to get the harvest from our growers. We've got our um, 2022 harvest of weld, cor weld flowers, coreopsis, uh, marigolds coming, and also a small amount of sulfur cosmos. And we only get this once a year. So if you're a sulfur cosmos aficionado, you need to buy it now. That's all I have to say. Um, this call is being recorded. Amy's going to monitor the chat once Alice is done with her presentation. And uh, let me just introduce Alice. So we are so, so, so pleased to welcome uh, Alice Fox, who has a brand new book that's coming out called Wild Textiles. Um, Alice is an artist and she'll be talking about how she has taken her allotment, which is what she'll explain to us what an allotment is, how she's taken her allotment and created all sorts of interesting works of art from the things that she finds around her. Um, she's not only growing food, she's growing fibers, she's growing dye stuffs. Um, and it's just really fascinating to, to see how a small piece of land can create so much uh, bounty and creativity for an artist who is in tune with what's going on around there, around them. So she's going to talk through the stages of flax growing, um, gathering various weeds like bramble, bindweed, and nettle, and explain how she uses them in her work. Um, she's based in Saltaire, West Yorkshire, and she exhibits and teaches nationally and internationally. Um, as you go through this presentation with Alice, you'll see some very, very arresting and inspiring uh, images of her work. And I just wanna share with her, with you, that last night, as it was starting to get dark, I got really inspired to just give you an example of how being channeled by bindweed looks like, because you'll see something like this in the, her presentation. And I just loved it so much. I just went out and grabbed stuff out of my yard and uh, made an homage to Alice Fox. So <laughs> Alice, lovely to have you here. Thank you for joining us and um, welcome to Feedback Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> it's really lovely to be here and um, lovely to uh, be talking to what I think is a lot of people, which is great, all over um, all over the world. So as Cathy said, I'm in um, north, the north of England in the UK, um, in West Yorkshire. Um, and um, I'm going to I'm going to just go into my slides. Is that OK? I'm going to share my screen and um, talk to you about my work. And that's what I need. Okay, so, um, right, so uh, welcome to, welcome to my kitchen, but, but in terms of the slides, welcome to my, my allotment plot. So um, as Cathy said, um, I'll just explain what that is. So in the UK, um, an allotment is the term we use for um, a, a piece of land that's often owned by um, either the council or it can be privately owned um, and little sections of that are rented to individuals to grow generally vegetables and fruit and some flowers on um, and I think in some parts of the the world it's it's also called an, a community garden so some of you may know of it um, may know of it like that um, so yeah so it's an allotment here and um, so this is my my plot, my allotment, and um, so as I said, it's a, the site is is owned by uh, the allotment society. Um, it's these 
place, this, this piece of land has been allotments for about 175 years. So it's got a really long history, um, particularly long on this site. Um, and I have this little piece of, of it, um, which I, I double checked because Kathy asked me the other day how big it is. It's 45 metres by 12 metres. So um, it's 45 metres long. Um, and what you see in this image here is me standing on one edge of it and the, the hedge the other side is 12 metres away and that's the width of it. Um, so that's the, it, that sort of helps you visualise it. So I've got, um, I've got beds like this which grow um, the, you know the, the normal stuff that you would find on this kind of garden side so growing stuff for the kitchen I'm growing food so here you can see pumpkins and corn and um, broccoli and uh, spinach and that kind of thing uh, the sunflowers are particularly good at the moment um, as we get to kind of the the back end of the season um, and so I it's it looks like an, a normal allotment to to most people but um the way that i approach it is is that i as well as growing the fruit and veg um and the things for the kitchen i also use the the stuff there creatively so i'm going to talk a little bit about that um one of the things that when we were discussing what i was going to talk about today um amy said that it would be really good to focus on what's happening now on the plot so i'm i'm going to talk quite a bit about that um and and touch on a few other things and i'm happy to to answer questions questions and so on um, beyond that when we finish. Um, okay, so that's my plot and, oh, I need to move on. Where do I move on? There we go. Um, okay, so there are sheds as well. So um, there's the plot, if you can imagine this kind of strip of land, there are beds on that that you've just seen. I've got fruit trees as well. So I've got apple trees and pear and plum and that kind of thing. Um, and then there are various structures. And I took the plot on about five years ago, um, almost exactly five years ago now. And um, the things that are on there, the, the kind of infrastructure was what I inherited with the plot. So, so this is the main shed, um, which serves as a kind of tool store and um, a working area, but it's also got glass, as you can see, and, um, and a vine growing in it. And I, I tend to use this for all sorts of things, including gathering and drying materials off to start with. So what you can see here is um, quite a lot of dandelion stems um, drying off. There's nettle hanging up. There's um, probably some bindweed hanging up there too. Um, there's all sorts of things. So it's a really kind of multi-purpose area. It's not beautiful. It's full of cobwebs and it's kind of dirty and very functional, um, but it's a really kind of useful space. And then I also have a greenhouse and um, a couple of other uh, sheds as well. So, um, so in terms of the way that I work creatively with what's on the plot, um, the, the starting point for me was when I started a, a master's degree and um, really this for me was about focusing my um, practice very much on um, the idea around being self-sufficient in art materials. So we think of um, allotments as um, places where people kind of practice or aim to be self-sufficient in food, but I wanted to kind of take it uh, in a slightly different direction and think about only using materials in my work that I've grown and gathered on the plot. Um, and the masters was a way for me to kind of test that out. So I was quite experimental to start with. And then there were things that emerged from that. Um, and one of those um, is cordage, making cordage. So um, what you see here is cordage made with sweet corn husks, um, leek, uh, dandelion stems, um, daffodil leaf, bramble uh, fibre and nettle fibre. And so this is the, the way that I will use a lot of the materials that I gather and, and then I can take those on to do other things, but the, the kind of cordage or string making is the kind of first step really. Um, and all of the fibres I use are different. Um, they've all got slightly different properties. They feel different in the hand. And that's one of the things that I'm really, that excites me is, is just getting to know a material by working with it um, and understanding the possibilities um, depending on the properties of each material. Um, the other thing just to say about this is that um, when I ran through that list of what you see here, two of them are from food crops, but the others are all from what most people would class as weed species. And um, I'm increasingly using the weeds that grow kind of around the plot, um, probably more so than, than um, other things. Um, 
So dandelion stems is one thing that I wanted to mention. So although I'm not really gathering these now, um, this, uh, this is from earlier in the year, so probably May time here in the UK when dandelions are really long in the spring. Um, but I'm, I'm working with those at the moment in the studio. So um, the, the times of harvest are kind of removed from the times that I tend to be then working with the fibres, but there's a really nice kind of um, seasonality to, to that. Um, so this is gathering the stems and I'm gathering the ones that grow amongst long grass so they grow really long and then those get dried and um, and then when I'm ready to use them, which is, is now um, at the moment I'm working on a big piece that's based on the same process as this so so they um, they fade or they shift from that lovely kind of fresh green through to these lovely kind of golden brown colours as they dry and then I dampen them to work with and then I make the cordage and and then this piece is um, is woven with that cordage and as I say I'm working on a on a big piece um, with this process at the moment. Um, and then another thing that I will do with the dandelions in particular is braiding. Um, so again, the, this, the dandelions just particularly lend themselves to this. They've got a nice kind of flatness to them um, when they're dried and, and they work really well. So I can braid them. And then um, in this case, it's been, they've then been stitched together with more dandelion stems into a kind of vessel that fits around a stone, which is from the plot. Um, and um, yeah, and then I, in a moment, I'll show you another example of that. Um, okay, so that's dandelion stems. As I said, I'm gonna go through a few different materials and just kind of talk about the, the different stages. Um, Kathy mentioned flax. So I, I grow a little bit of flax each year. And in a way, that's the one thing that would, um, would make my plot look different to other people's um, on the site. Um, I'm not aware of anyone else growing flax, um, but it's a really beautiful plant to grow and um, I, just kind of fell in love with it from the first time I, I tried to grow it a few years ago. So um, it's easy to grow in, in the climate here, the kind of Northern European climate, it's, it, it grows really happily. Um, it, it germinates quickly and you, uh, grows quickly and you get these lovely delicate blue flowers, which last only a few hours each. Um, and then they turn to seed. And um, so the whole process of growing the flax is, is about 100 days from when you sow it through to when you harvest it. And then there's a whole set of other processes that happen. Um, so this is from uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, where I the, the flax was ready to pull. So you can see the seed heads and it starts to kind of yellow off and the seeds are starting to ripen. So that's the time to, to, to harvest it. And I pull up the whole plant and then that gets dried. And then... Um, once it's dried, I can then uh, ret it. So this is a process where um, there are various different ways of doing it. You can, but it involves water. Um, so you can either submerge it, and you know traditionally there are ponds that would have been used for for um, for water retting. Um, and this is this process here is what's called dew retting, where you lay it out on the grass, and over a period of days, the the dew that forms overnight. Um, on the grass um, dampens the fibers and the bacteria then um, that's that's present can start to break down the, the, the usable fiber from the, the, the core of the stem. Um, and you have to do this in order to be able to get the fiber from it. It's one of those kind of processes that it's a little bit of a kind of dark art in that it's like it's different every year and um, depends on the conditions, the weather conditions, the warmth and, and the moisture and everything. So it's, it's um, and it's a case of kind of you never know really until it when it's done until it is done you have to kind of keep an eye on it this year i found that um just because um we had a, a week of very wet or very heavy showers just when i'd left it out um that it actually retted really quickly and um did it in, in a week which is quicker than i've had it done before but as i say it's different every time so this is very recent and then that um that was then taken up just a few days ago, um, put into the greenhouse here that you can see to dry off. And then yesterday I brought that home because um, it's starting to get damp at the um, in in the at night. So I don't want things to go mouldy. And that's one of the kind of really key things with working with these kind of fibers is knowing um, is knowing when to move them around and what the conditions are like because it's very easy for things to get lost. Um, a whole 
set of stuff to be lost to mold very quickly. Um, and I also just wanted to mention here, because this is in the, the greenhouse, I've got um, the black bin that you can see at the back there is a woad vat. And that's the first, this is the first year I've actually tried to, um, to use the, the woad that I've grown. Um, so that's quite exciting. And um, that's kind of still work in progress. Um, and it's in the greenhouse to be, to try and keep it warm. Um, so, yeah. Um, Okay, so the flax, um, obviously the flax that you've just seen is the stuff from this year, um, but just to give you um, an insight into what will then happen at some point over the winter when I'm not doing other things, um, that then goes through a whole set of processes um, with these lovely words attached, so um, breaking and scutching and hackling, there's all these different kind of terms that, that we use in, in flax processing. It's quite hard work to kind of deal with this all by hand, but again, it's something, there's something really, um, really kind of pure about taking this fiber from kind of seed and right through all these different processes all by hand. Um, and so that's what you see there is, is the fiber that's then ready to spin um, once it's had its final comb. Um, and then what you see here in my, um, my gardening dirty hands, um, which actually I think are really important because it's, you know, that, that's real, um, is, is the spun fibre. Um, so there's, that's the flax linen thread that I've spun and that can then on, be, be used for obviously any kind of textile process um, onward. So that's the flax. Um, this is... Um, this is the bindweed that Kathy was mentioning. Um, and I think this is the image that inspired her activity last night. Um, so as I said, the, the weeds on the plot are, have become increasingly important in my work. And there's something again that I find really attractive about these kind of undervalued plants. Um, I mean, I'm, I should stop calling them weeds because I, you know, I'm, I'm harvesting them, I'm using them. They're not, a weed is something that's growing in the wrong place. To me, these are growing in the right place and I know I can use them. Uh, that's not to say I don't occasionally get really cross with bindweed in particular because it just grows like mad. Um, but to be able to pull it out and then use it creatively, um, there's something really nice about that too. Um, and before anybody offers, I've got plenty of, of my own, thank you very much. Um, it grows like mad down the, this, the hedge at the side of my plot and, um, and so on. Anyway, so the, the bindweed, it's got lovely strong stems. Um, any gardeners will know that when you, you know, try and pull it out, it's really strong stuff. And um, so I, I pull it up, um, and it comes out in these lovely long lengths. I strip the leaves off and then I wind them into these little kind of um, sections, little kind of around my hand and then put them on a cane and hang those up to dry in the, the greenhouse um, or the, the shed. And um, again, as just like with the dandelions that you've seen, the, the, the colors shift from this lovely mix of purpley, green, pinky kind of colors um, through to, um, there's again a lovely mix of tones, but these lovely browns and kind of almost golden colors. Um, so this is the dried bindweed. And then this is me then using it to, um, to work with. And again, the, just like I showed you with the dandelion, I tend to do particular processes with that. So I, I twist that into cordage and I braid it. With the bindweed, I just find that actually the nature of it, it's quite flat. I don't tend to make it into cordage. It's nice and strong as it is. Whereas some of the fibers um, are only strong when you twist them into that, that um, two ply structure. Um, so the bindweed, I, I tend to do these kind of coiled structures with. So this one is a work in progress. And um, then the piece on the left here is the final piece that you've just seen in progress. Um, and so that's a big piece. I'm trying to think what the dimensions are. It's kind of about maybe 50 centimeters tall. Um, by about kind of 30 or something. Um, and you can see that lovely kind of color variation. And then the piece on the right here is the braided dandelions again. And those have been stitched together again with, with more dandelions. So it's, it's only dandelion, there's no other material in there. Um, and I just included these two um, in their framed state to just uh, mention that these are going off to America um, 
next week and they're going to be in an exhibition in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, and the exhibition is called The Conceptual Stitch and it's at Concord Art, the Centre for the Visual Arts in Concord um, from the 3rd of November um, through until the 18th of December. So these two are going off with, with one other piece and um, I'm really excited that, that they're going off to um, on their travels. Um, okay. Um, just another example of the bindweed. So um, this is obviously on a much smaller scale. Um, again, it's this, it's it's so strong. I just love kind of playing with it. And and what happens is it's it's lovely, strong, and flexible when it's damp. Um, when I've I've dampened it to work with it, having having previously dried it. Um, and just to mention that, that that initial drying process is really key to working with all of these fibers, because if you work with them fresh they've got so much water in them that they'll then shrink and then you'll get a, a loose structure. Um, but if you dry them first, which is the kind of convention with basketry and so on, um, the, the fibers do their shrinking and then you just redampen them enough to make them fle flexible again. And then they can be worked with and then they'll dry again. And one of the things that I really love about the bindweed is that it, when it then dries off again after working, it it's goes really hard again. And, and so you can make structures that really kind of um, hold themselves well. Um, this is a, a small piece. Um, obviously, you can see from my fingers the scale of it, but um, it's formed around an egg, a hen's egg, and this is part of a series of, of work I'm making for um, the textile study group, which is a group I'm in here in the UK, um, and, and this will be shown next year as part of our next um, exhibition, and I'm making 50 small vessels, all based around um, using eggs as the starting point, and um, so yeah, this is one of those. Um, and then just a, another um, little example of the um, of the bindweed. Um, again, it's that same coiled and stitched structure that you saw um, with the the framed piece, and this time it's in a vessel. Um, and um, this is one of the pieces that's, um, as some of the others are mentioned in in the new book, um, and also this one's in sh on show at the moment as well here in Yorkshire. Um, so yeah. The, a, a, it's quite versatile um, material and um, and really lovely kind of structure once it dries off again. Um, and then one of the other um, so-called weed species, or um, maybe we should start calling them volunteer plants. I quite like that term. Um, is bramble. Um, this is one so blackberry. Um, and again, this is one that that grows loads here in the UK and um, and I know that um, you also have it too in in America um, and again it's got it's got lots of um, traditional uses in sort of basketry and so on um, you can I know you can use it as a split bramble to to kind of stitch baskets together and so on um, the the way that I tend to use it is um, what you can see here is me splitting the fiber off. So obviously when they're um, when they're growing, um, they're um, they're very thorny and and sharp. Um, so I I cut these the, the new long stems, and with gloves on rub um, rub the leaves and some of the spikes off and then I use the back of a, a knife to to scrape off the rest of the spikes and the kind of skin effectively the, the sort of um, almost bark of the um, of the bramble and then once you've done that you can then just split it and this these lovely um, strong fresh green fibers come off um, away from the the core of the stem and then those can be again dried um, and again they they kind of shift from that lovely um, fresh green through to um, a kind of buff colour. Um, and then this is a piece um, that's made with that bramble fibre. Um, it's really strong. It's really tough stuff. It's quite hard on the hands to work with, um, but uh, but really strong and, and beautiful stuff. Um, so this is another piece, another example. Actually, this one's also going off to that exhibition in America. Um, and um, this was um, taking a... a a found broken tool from the plot um, and adding on this kind of vessel element with the fibers. And again, this is an example of, of the way that I will often work um, is to take an object. Um, so just like the stone you saw earlier or the broken tools um, and to then kind of respond to those and um, work onto them or around them or, or whatever um, to create a, a piece. 
so that's the bramble um so that's that's the kind of um the stuff that, that i'm harvesting at the moment those um it we're just getting towards the back end of the the season for harvesting things um and and those will be kind of drying off and and then i can use those in the winter when um when the other kind of activity is is uh, quieter on the plot so i just wanted to mention a few other examples of the way that i've used um things from the plot um this is um the detail from a piece that I did a few years ago where I was recording the, the plot um, in terms of the colours I could get from the plants that are growing there. Um, so a complete mix of, of crops, of kind of planted crops and, and things that were growing voluntarily um, and using botanical contact printing. And I, and I made one of these little books for every week of the year and I filled it each week with the plants that were available and, and steamed it so I could get these lovely plant prints. And really this was just a test to see what was actually there through the year. Um, could I, could I um, get enough um, material, plant material to, to record it right the way through the year? And of course the variety changed and there was much more in the, the sort of growing season months, but there were things all through the year. So this was a piece called 52 Weeks and um, it was like a sort of calendar of, of what was growing on the plot. Um, and that's on paper. Um, another example on paper is um, was making inks from the plants on the plot. Um, just really basic um, ink making and um, but but then using that to to map the plot to and to record the plot in different ways. So the grids that you see at the back there were were different ways of recording. The one in the middle is um is basically a map of the plot, and then I was adding in squares with the inks from where they were growing on the plot. Um, the one on the right was a, oh, sorry, that's my phone. Um, just, I'm just gonna turn that off, excuse me. Really sorry, I should have, should have done that before we started. Anyway. Um, uh, yeah, and then you can see on the on the table there other other ways of using the ink. So drawing, um, drawing with them, writing with them, and again, just different ways of engaging with what was there, and but really recording the plot. Um, and I find that this is a particularly a way that I like to record things that I wouldn't otherwise use in in sort of textile processes. So. Um, as an example here of um, of ceramic fragments, and 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 I dig these up all the time, and I know that lots of other gardeners, whether you're a gardener or not, a lot of people find these in in their um, in their plots. Um, I've no idea what the age of some of them are, you know, of any of them are. Some of them might be really old, some of them might not be that old at all. Um, but there's something, it always feels like digging up treasure when these things come to the surface. And, um, but it, that I just really like to, to find a way of engaging with them, even though they're not material that I'm kind of um, accustomed to working with in terms of my textile background. So to be able to draw them and um, and kind of lay them out and study them and, and, and drawing them is a way of kind of celebrating them. And to use the inks that I've made from the plot is um, you know, a particularly um, uh, apposite way of, of doing that. Um, so, and then just, just to mention, um, again, I know a lot of people know of um, my work through rust printing. Um, it's not something that I'm sort of doing all the time, but um, but I I am always drawn to um, uh, any rusty object because just because I know the potential, and in a way I think this sums up the way that I work. My approach is um, they these were all objects that that I found in various locations, and then I kind of created I. Cr um, responded creatively to them by creating a, a fabric around them with, by weaving them and then allowing them to stay in that fabric and kind of um, uh, um, inhabit the fabric, is, I suppose, um, by putting them in seawater to, to allow them to stain the fibres and um, and again, I think this is it, it sums up there's, there's the there's the element of the found, the element of kind of what happens to be around me wherever I am. But but also this idea of just of setting up a process and then seeing what happens and not necessarily knowing what the outcome is going to be, not having a kind of 
designed um, end point, but just seeing what happens and and then and kind of appreciating the beauty in that and the way that it changes and um, and uh, where it ends up. So that's my slides. I'm going to come out of my screen share. Alice, that was so beautiful, inspiring, amazing. I've been scribbling notes like crazy of things that <laughs> It just resonates, but I know there are many, 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 many questions. And so I'm okay. going to turn it over to Amy um, so we can start our conversation. All right. Thanks, Alice. I'm Hi. still like it re, re inspired I, the, the rust, the rust dying. I think I paid attention <laughs> to that a little bit more too. Um, I'm just going to jump in. Some of these questions are going to go all over the place, but I just start at the That's top. Fine. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Gina's asking, do you remove the seed heads on the flax prior to redding? You do. Yes. Um, good question. So um, again, it's got a lovely term. It's called rippling. Um, you ripple the flax and that's um, basically combing off the, the seeds. Um, and the reason you do that, so partly so you can then use the seed for the next year. So I save it and um, do my best to, um, what's the word, um, uh, where you uh, winnow it, where you kind of blow away the chaff. Um, I'm not very good at it, but um, uh, doing it on a, a breezy day is good. So um, you can save the seed obviously, but also if you leave, if you left the seed on, um, it can then um, add a kind of stickiness to the, um, to the process. So you want to get rid of the seeds um, before you ret it, yeah. Mm. Is that similar to hemp with like the kind of lignin? Is that what it is it's called? Lignin? Uh, quite possibly. I've not used hemp. I don't know what the process is, but I imagine it's pretty similar. Yeah. Okay. Mm. All right. Uh, let's see. Alice said she stitches the pieces with the same materials like dandelion. How does she do that? So how do you do this? How do you stitch? Well, just, I mean, by, by trying things and seeing what works and what doesn't. And, um, uh, so stitching, particularly stitching those braids of dandelion together, that that came about by trying. I'd, I'd made a series of braids. I wanted to stitch them together. I tried various different materials. I think the first, the very first one I did, I used um, a found, a deconstructed found rope from the um, from the allotment, and um, and that kind of worked. But it was it just wasn't right. And I tried various different threads. And everything I tried, it just, there was something about it that jarred, it wasn't quite right. And then I thought, well, I'll just try it with one of the stems and I'll see if they're strong enough on their own to do it. And, and they are, they're good and strong. Mm. So, um, I mean, it doesn't, I do get breakages occasionally. And I, it's with it, with all of these processes, it's a case of, you can't just necessarily do them straight away. You've got to kind of develop the skills and figure out how far you can push them into each of the materials. And sometimes I feel like I'm starting from scratch every time with a different material because they all are slightly different to work with. Um, but yeah, it, to me, there's, there's something I really like about the purity of only one material. And I think that's why I really like these woven, the way that I do these woven pieces it's one thread, it's one continuous thread in the warp and weft that I'm adding to as I weave. And again, it's that purity of only one material that, that is almost like this kind of holy grail for me. I like that very much, so yeah. yeah. Is that something that you do kind of seasonally, pick a, pick a plant like that so that you know it like fairly, fairly well? Um, I tend to I, I go through little phases so I, at the moment I'm working with the dandelion a lot because I've been asked to make a big piece with that so um, uh, when I did that vessel with the spade and the bramble I was really just getting to grips with the bramble and kind of getting to know it I haven't worked with bramble for a while now so it just it just depends um, what I'm working on but I mean all, all of this kind of knowledge is the, the kind of physical knowledge of working with it with the materials is cumulative so every time I spend time with any particular material I'm getting to know more about that material I am getting to know perhaps more possibilities with others as well but it's only through spending that time with it in your hands that you can really understand it mm -hmm. okay um, is bindweed the same as morning glory pant or pants plants <laughs> um 
I think they're related. I, I think of morning glory as a more of an ornamental thing. You get those lovely, they have a purple flower, don't they? I think rather than, whereas the bindweed is, um, is growing wild here, it's, um, it's got a white flower. They're, I'm sure they're definitely part of the same family, whether they're exactly the same thing, I don't know. Um, the, I tend to um, use, if I'm, if I'm referring to things, I'll often use the, um, the Latin name. So the, the bindweed I'm using is Calistegia sepium. I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but that's, so that's the variety I'm using from here. Mm. Okay. Do you have wood nettle in the UK? Oh, I don't know. We have, um, we call it a co common nettle. Um, it's Urtica doica, I think. Um, so I know there are a lot, there are different species of nettle in different parts of the world. Um, yeah, stinging nettle is what we generally call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, do you need to ret bindweed and dandelion? And have you worked with Virginia creeper? Fascinating work. Thank you. Um, I haven't worked with Virginia creeper. Um, I tend to, uh, as, as, as I've said, I, I, I work with the stuff that I've got growing on my plot, but it doesn't mean that um, there aren't other people using Virginia creeper. Um, I don't, you don't need to wrap the, um, the dandelion or the, the bindweed because those are being used um, kind of unprocessed, if you like. The only processing that's happening there is the drying and then dampening to twist them a, a, again or to, to work with them. But but with the with the flax and with nettle as well, with nettle, there's there's different ways of of working with it and processing it. And again, um, there's a huge amount of information about that in the, the book that's just come out. But um, in terms of 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 those of extracting the fiber from um, that you can spin with um, from the flax, you've got to go through that retting process. But that's it's 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 a bit similar to the kind of stripping off the bramble fiber. You can't use the stem as it is whole for kind of spinning. But if you can um, extract certain parts of it, then whereas yeah, the bindweed and the dandelion, I'm using the whole stem. It's just dried. Um. Hey, Brit Bulls, uh, lovely pieces. How do the volunteer fibers take color? Well, um, yeah, so that's something I'm only just starting to experiment with. So some of them are quite dark already. So obviously the bindweed and the, um, and the dandelion, they've got a kind of real, they've got a lot of pigment still in them, even though it shifts as, as it dries. Uh, I wouldn't probably bother to try dyeing those. Um, but some of the other, um, so the flax and, uh, or linen and the nettle, um, those will take color. And I'm only just, as I say, I'm only just kind of really uh, dipping my toe in, into that dye vat. Um, so I've currently got some stuff in this woad vat at the, at the allotment that you've just seen. Um, so um, yeah, there's definitely potential. And some of the other the fibers, I mean, I've got, again, I'm experimenting in that woad vat with, um, with the uh, sweet corn fiber, because that's really light colored. So I was thinking, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that I've seen um, that um, in dyed forms in sort of uh, basketry stuff. So um, I watch this space on that, I don't know yet. <laughs> All right. I think what, just to add to that, actually, one of the things with, with dyeing is, is because all of these materials, they're so kind of hard won, and I don't necessarily have a huge amount of each one each year to work with. So in order to then have enough to experiment with, with, you know, further is um, it, it's kind of one step at a time, really. Um, so, yeah, I, I'll hopefully be able to um, experiment more with that as we go on. All right. Um, Teddy is asking, how do you spin? Um, with a wheel, drop spindle, twist by hand? Um, so when I'm spinning the flax or, um, or some of the nettle, um, if I, I've got, I have got a wheel, um, a treadle wheel thing. Um, uh, I, I have done it on a drop spindle as well, but if I've got a, um, a quantity of it than, than using the spinning wheel. I, st I still feel like a bit of a beginner spinner. So um, I'm, I'm just kind of getting, getting to grips with that. And I, it's not something I'm doing all the time. And I've not learned, I never learned to spin with, with wool first um, or whatever. So it's, it's, it's new to me. I understand that, that people say that 
spinning with linen um, with flax is, is harder than spinning with, with wool because you haven't got the kind of flexibility that you have with wool. But um, that's the only thing I've, I've spun with. I had a kind of crash course from somebody um, a few years ago and um, yeah, so, and then the other, that, so when I talk about cordage, that's, that's all done by hand, um, uh, basically making a two ply um, string uh, by hand. So with no other tools. Okay. Samantha Verone is asking, who's a rust dyer? You guys should definitely follow each other. <laughs> Samantha, I see you. Also, I'm wearing Samantha's jacket. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Alice. Love, love, love your work. As a fellow rust dye journey woman, I have journey woman, I have to ask you about your rust marks work. Can you talk about your practice with rust? Right. Oh, what do you want to know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, I did, I did a lot of rust dyeing um, about a decade ago was when I got started and I did a big project, a big residency project at, at Spurn Point in East Yorkshire um, here in the UK in 2012. And um, so, yeah, 10 years ago. Um, and that really got me started on, on the, um, the rust dyeing because I was using things from the beach and there was a lot of rusty metal on the beach and it was a nature reserve, is a nature reserve. So I wasn't allowed to pick plants. So um, where I was kind of interested in natural, using natural dyes, I, I wasn't allowed to use the plants from there because of its status. So I could only use the stuff that was basically kind of washed up on the beach. So that got me really into the rust dyeing. Um, I tend to, uh, when I when I teach rust dyeing, I use I use tea. I use the tannins. Um, I, I like the tannins, the reaction you get with the tannin, with the rust, you get a much wider range of tones um, than you do with salt or vinegar. Um, I don't like using vinegar. It smells, it's, I, it, it just doesn't do it for me. Um, <laughs> tea, whereas tea is just you know the subtleties that you get with with different teas is um uh, and and of course that's so kind of closely related to then the botanical contact printing and you know the tannins that we're getting in the leaves and and how that reacts with with iron so it's it's just one step away really from from um a lot of these other botanical processes um I, I do, so the image you saw of those little woven pieces, those were done with seawater. And so generally my approach is that if I'm working with things from the coast, with objects I've picked up from the beach, then I will use seawater because it just feels right. Whereas um, for other things that I've picked up um, away from the coast, then I tend to, to use tea. Um, yeah, or, or I've used a lot more in, in more recent years, um, made uh, basically a tannin kind of dye bath with, with oak galls, um, which again is something that I can gather locally. Mm. Yeah. Uh, a couple of people have asked where the Concord ex exhibition will be. And also a, a question tagged onto that one was, do you use nettles? But I think I, I, think I found the site that you're, is it Concord Art? Concord Art is the yeah, name. Okay. That's the that's the name of the gallery. The website. Um, okay. It's it's called Con uh, Cent Concord Center for the Visual Arts, I think. But but the the website is Concord Art. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And um, the yeah, the exhibition. I I mean, it's it's uh, it's curated by um, by Jane Deering, who's invited me to be to send work. I don't actually know who else is in the exhibition, but it's it's a textiles based exhibition. Um, yeah. Okay, but I not just, necessarily conventional textiles. I just put the link in the chat. If you live in Massachusetts or want to make the journey, yeah. let's have lunch and go see it together. <laughs> All right. Um, which plants do your hands love using the most? Oh, um, hmm. Um, I, I'm pretty much in love with the dandelions, um, <laughs> I have to say. Um, <laughs> They're soft. There's there's a kind of uh, there's a sweet. It's not just my hands. There's a sweet aroma from them um, when you're working with them. That you know, it's almost kind of honeyish um, with the dandelion that I really like. That, and but again, there's something I that I like them all. <laughs> it's I can't I can't really because and they're all different. Um, I think I I said that the bramble is is hard on the hands. It's hard work. Um, that that was. Um, as I say, I haven't used those for a while, but the the structure that I know I can get from them makes it worthwhile. Um, 
but I really do appreciate the um, the aroma of the different fibres as well as the feel of them. Um, it's mm -hmm. kind of multi-sensory, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. That's fun. I think with natural dyes, it's the same way. We, I've had yeah. a, lots yeah, of yeah. conversation with dyers about this, as different smells, like seasonal definitely. smells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Definitely, somebody's asking, will you be running an online rust workshop? And maybe... I know we're trying to pull you in for next year to do a workshop with us, but I know you have workshops on your website. Yeah, too. I do. Um, so I do have an online rust dyeing workshop, oh, rust good. Um, which I will run again at some time, some point over the winter. So um, I just haven't fixed the dates, but it will be, um, it'll go on, on the website once I've sorted that out. So yeah, that, that will run again. And there's another online thing that will run over the winter as well. Um, okay. So yeah, the best thing is to just keep an eye either on the workshops page of my website, but, or I, you can sign up for a newsletter and I'll, or, or follow me on Instagram and so on. And I'll, I announce things on then, but yeah, just need to fix the dates. Yeah. And again, like when we have the video post up in the RSVP post that you RSVP'd for this has her website and Instagram links on it right now. Mm -hmm. um, okay. When you weave objects, are they all off loom or do you use a loom? Um, oh. So it generally off a loom but I'm just I'm kind of um I'm saying that without complete certainty because I have I have incorporated things it depends on the scale um so I've for instance I have made, I made a really long piece um long and narrow a few years ago that had um rusty objects incorporated in the weave that was done on the loom because it was just you know it's quicker to to weave that way um and it was long and I could keep moving it along um but generally I do things either on frames or, um, or just on the object themselves. It, yeah, it, it just depends. It, it, it'll be led by the object really. Um, and I, I mean, I've, so a lot of the pieces I've done in the last few years have been really quite small scale. Um, that's kind of shifting again, or some of that shifting, but um, so yeah, it just depends. Um, but I, I really like to, I, I will often just use the object itself as, as the loom, if, if you like. Um, yeah. Okay. I just went forward because I know we're getting kind of closer to the, to the end, but um, let's see. So Beth is asking, dandelion is hollow, right? So you're using yeah. it whole and not twisting. I have very long hollow iris stems that I always thought would be great for weaving. I am to I when so when I'm making the cordage I am twisting them um they are hollow I'm generally just using them whole like they are um occasionally if they're really thick I will split them down depends how thick you want your cordage to be um and the main thing with those is they vary quite a lot so I might it and, and it's about trying to keep it as consistent as possible in terms of the, the width so I might have more than one in any one uh, at, at any one time or I might just have one or I might have them kind of split down so um yeah it's about consistency really um iris yeah I haven't used iris much but and there again there are lots of different iris species so the one I have used is is one I've just got growing in the garden here it's an ornamental thing um strappy leaves yeah um yeah I mean basically you can it's just worth giving anything a go <laughs> um, and that's the best way of finding out what the possibilities are <laughs> we all go into the weekend with needles and threads and running around our yards and yeah. ripping out by weed the main thing is, ju is just to remember to don't don't get too carried away and use it fresh because your hard work will will fall apart probably mm. is dry things off first and some things will dry fairly quickly but um yeah. Okay. Um, I want to know this too. How do you frame the flat textile work? Is it in glass? How is it mounted in the frame? Those beautiful pieces that you have in the concrete. Yeah. So there's right. no, there's no glass with those. Um, partly because I've got to ship them across the Atlantic. And so no glass was a, is, is a benefit for weight and safety. Um, but also I don't want them enclosed in glass. Um, you know, I, I, Ideally, I prefer things not to be framed at all, but there is something about something I know that can work really well about, about having them mounted in a frame. Um, so I tend to um, stitch 
the pieces onto um, mount board or um, and, and I, I never I would never glue them on or whatever again I stitch everything by hand um, so I stitch them onto the, the backing and then um, those are both of those pieces are actually kind of I like to think have things kind of floating in the frame so they've got a, a piece of, of mounting that then raises them off the background um, so it's quite fiddly to get it right but um, that can make all the difference to how mm. these things are presented. There's so many really beautiful comments in here of longtime fans of yours. And <laughs> when we do put the video up, Alice, you'll have to go through and just see all the comments right. that people are making there for you too, because that the tech, the chat will be included in that as well. Right. Um, I just started chuckling over the, somebody was asking if you use <laughs> caffeinated or decaffeinated tea. <laughs> oh, well, just give it a go. Every tea is going to be <laughs> different. Okay. Um, all right. Um, yeah, more, lots of really great comments. And yes, if anybody wants to do a Massachusetts, uh, lunch trip, you email me, amy at botanicalcolors.com. Let's do a Massachusetts trip to that museum in November. I'm totally down with do, that. You have to send me pictures. That'd be great. We'll get a, yeah, we'll get a group and we'll stand in front of the pictures we just saw. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that is it. And you know, I've put a couple of times the, the books, uh, Alice's book, that's, I put it beautiful. Yeah, I cannot wait to get this. I, I, yes. <laughs> but you can pre-order it right now on our site. We're just waiting for the, uh, for the delivery of it, but we've, we've definitely ordered them and we're waiting to get them. We'll, we should probably get them really soon. Yeah. And I've got other books on my website as well. So there's a, there's a, there's a book all about my plot and how I use it and um, all sorts of different things as well. You actually have a beautiful lot, cards, a lot of publications <laughs> on there on your books page. I was like, wait a minute. Yes. There's yeah, a really, really inspiring stuff. And your first book, I actually checked it out from the library uh, on, you know, the, the, doing the textile work. It was so beautiful and inspirational again. So yeah, what a treat. Alice, you are such a treat to have with us today. Um, you know, inspiration, resources, answers, uh, technique, all of the things that we love using, um, things that are considered not valuable and making works of art from them. Um, just, just everything growing. Uh, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, we had a, a presentation at New York Textile Month. So it's just perfect. Wednesday, we did that presentation that was talking about noxious invasives and what could be done with them in terms of color. And then now you are showing us a completely new um, perspective in looking at them as a fiber source. And yeah, my I'm about to explode here, but yes, <laughs> I try and keep it under control. My favorite um, statement from Kathy when when that happens, it's not all the time, but she's yeah, yeah no, she I mean, we love night. all of our guests, right? But I mean, sometimes people just resonate with you and what they're doing and the journey they're taking. It's so interesting. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Alice. Um, it looks like we're at the top of the hour. And so, uh, Amy, are we ready to unmute and everyone say hello? Sure. And goodbye. And Alice, sure. thank you so much. Um, you, feel free to hang out with us for a few minutes and then we're going to adjourn. But yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thanks so Bye. much. Bye. <laughs> Beautiful. Bye. Thanks. See you next week. I really want to. Um, Alice. Know. All right. This is this is Gina Simpson Lee from Boulder, Colorado, and I grow and process flax uh, in my backyard. Great. Um, and I love your work. I've been following you for a few years. Thank you so much. This was an incredible presentation. Like, oh, like, <laughs> and my head's exploding too. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, a bunch of videos oh flat happening. Yeah, everybody just like hold your heads tight. <laughs> yeah, Harry, oh. hang on. <laughs> we will get through this. <laughs> we'll get through this. <laughs> we will get through this. We got this. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> These two women are from. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. Oh, Kathy, you're still recording. I'm going to stop the recording. Here we go.